Russia has launched a military assault on Ukraine, hitting targets across the country. US President Joe Biden has condemned the attack as unjustified and unprovoked. Here in Germany, Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock has just said if the world does not respond, we will pay an even higher price. Russian President Vladimir Putin announced the move in an unscheduled TV address shortly before 6 a.m. in Moscow. He said he'd been left with no choice because of the threat emanating from Ukraine. Within minutes, explosions were reported in numerous places, including the southern port cities of Odessa and Mariupol, as well as Kramatorsk and Kharkiv in the east, the Dnipro in central Ukraine and the capital, Kiev. DW's Fanny Facha is in the capital, Kiev. Fanny, what a night, what a morning for people there. What is the situation like in Kiev where you are? Actually, it is worsening in terms of the announcement that are being made right now by the Ukrainian government. The U.S. president is uh, basically taking everything to social media, trying to inform people there. The Ukrainian defense minister says everyone who is able to hold a weapon is basically called upon to join the defense forces. That clearly underlines what's been already analyzed over the course of the past weeks, that Ukrainians' military forces are in inferior compared to Russia's military. Now, we do not know how the situation is going to further escalate, but let me tell you, as we woke up to the uh, explosions this morning, that really was a shock to many here. People in Kyiv didn't think, even to the last minute, that actually Russia is going to go so far as a, a, a assaulting Kyiv, the capital city. After also, after all, also Vladimir Putin pointed out in this surprised televised, surprising televised address this morning that this is, quote, a military operation in eastern Ukraine. But it turns out there are various reports that explosions are heard in many parts of the country, shellings and uh, reports of people being injured and killed. Now, the problem is we cannot verify this information, so I'm not even going to uh, talk about any numbers at this point, because as this escalation has entered a new phase, there are various accusations between uh, Russian forces and Ukrainian uh, government official military information. What is actually currently happening on the ground? I can only tell you, in fact, what I've been experiencing this morning. And that was a very, very critical situation. People here were packing up, trying to leave uh, by car from the hotel where we are at this point. Also, we are hearing that there are a lot of people lined up at gasoline stations, trying to fill up on gas, trying to leave to neighboring uh, countries, Slovakia, Poland, towards the west. But we also hear at this point, if you're trying to leave Kyiv, it's in fact almost impossible to go towards the west. So much traffic, traffic has built up. Again, there are also people who are just staying put and are trying to uh, uh, inform themselves, actually, where is the nearest shelter when those sirens are going to uh, go off again, likely as they did this morning, siren warning, or in fact telling people, this is the time that you should look for your closest shelter. And these are similar reports that we're getting funny from our other correspondents in the country, also from family and friends, personal messages I've been getting from uh, uh, different parts of the country, central parts of the country, in Dnipro, for example, waking up to these explosions. Uh, could you tell us the Ukrainian president announced he was introducing martial law? What does that entail? Martial law is usually introduced in, in, in times of crisis that could be uh, could be a natural disaster uh, situation uh, of conflict or a war. So what is happening is basically the natural way of things as uh, they proceed in any uh, democratic country to say so to implement martial law by that also implying to the citizens here that this is not the time that they should venture out but they should actually stay put, stay at home, stay inside, look for the closest shelter uh, position and just remain also so calm because this is actually the concern here that people will start to panic even more and then what how you how can you secure critical infrastructure that is needed to protect actually citizens and to protect uh, people from a uh, from a uh, increasing escalation so military law, uh, martial law uh, rather is implemented because it can no longer be maintained or guaranteed that the civilian government law that is 
in, in place normally can guarantee the security of citizens. This is when the military takes over, usually setting up checkpoints. We haven't seen it just yet here in the city center, but it's likely to happen. Military checkpoints, checking exit, uh, uh, exiting uh, streets uh, from uh, Kiev, checking people who uh, are on the street. What documents do they carry? Are they actually supposed to be on the street? It's also a uh, law by which um, the uh, government can uh, sort of make sure and impose that people do not gather, that they really stay put and stay at home. Exactly, and, and not be on the move. I was asked this morning uh, about an 84-year-old man. Uh, how do we get him out of Ukraine? The, the uh, problem is at the moment uh, moving and to stay put is the safest option, as you say. Um, tell us what else uh, Zelensky has been saying today. Zelensky made clear what he believes is not just a military operation, as uh, Russia's President Vladimir Putin announced early this morning, but he says he expects, basically, that Russia wants to destroy Ukraine. Now, these are, of course, very strong words. And people here are hoping on the ground that it's not going to go as far as uh, as far as a full-scale, full-fledged invasion of the entire country. Ukraine's President Zelensky wants to maintain self-confidence. In fact, the spokesperson of his presidency also made clear there is no panic in the presidency. Speaking to people on the ground, they wonder when somebody says there is no panic, whether that actually means there is going to be panic. Mm. But overall, what Ukraine tries to maintain, as they did also over the course of the past days, as the escalation started to enter a new level, to maintain that this is a democratic, independent, sovereign country, and they're not going to give up on any land. They will not have any foreign entity to take over here and rule this country. Now, we are not so far yet, but there is, of course, concern here on the ground, especially because so many things have happened over the course of the past couple of days that were highly unlikely that at this point, everything is likely. Fanny, thank you very much for your reporting. Uh, the, the, the story itself is moving so fast. Let's have a listen in now to what the Ukrainian president has been saying. Dear Ukrainians, this morning, President Putin announced a special military operation in the Donbas. Russia carried out strikes on our military infrastructure, on our border guards. Explosions were heard in many cities of Ukraine. We are introducing martial law throughout the state. I have had a conversation with President Biden. The US is gathering international support. Today we need each of you, each of you to be calm. If possible, stay at home, please. We are working. The army is working. The entire security and defense sector of Ukraine is working. I, the National Security and Defense Council, the government will be in touch. Soon I will be in touch again. Don't panic. We are strong. We are ready for everything and we will defeat anyone. Because we are Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. Ukrainian president trying to keep the calm there. Uh, Fanny, back to you. Um, tell us more about the developments happening there and the mood there in the capital. Supermarkets are being closed. In fact, everything uh, that is uh, normally considered essential is closed, except gasoline stations. That clearly indicates for you that more unfortunately may come and those people who decided to leave today they do not want to just wait here and see what else to come they really want to flee towards the west so neighboring countries like slovakia poland are expecting an influx of uh, refugees actually from ukraine Really, as I'm saying, the, all of this, uh, even me, I didn't think just a week ago it's going to happen this fast, that here in the capital city, in Kyiv, people are going to have to make this decision about to stay or leave. Now, you have to know that the border with Belarus is just to the north, 200 kilometers from here. Ukraine said that the explosions, in fact, those that we have heard this morning, that was initiated from Belarus, what Belarus said, they never participated in any uh, military support with that regard uh, or assault uh, and, and support of Russian troops. This is the problem at this point. A lot of things are blurry in terms of who 
where things originate from what we can see of course that the aggression from russian troops is going beyond the region of donbass uh, way beyond the, the border of Donbass and the question really is just how far and how intense uh, this uh, what's being called an invasion is going to continue and what that will uh, trigger in terms of uh, Ukrainians uh, panicking and what that panic actually means for security here on the ground. What it sounds like there is uh, the development of an information war, the sowing of mistrust and confusion. Thank you very much for your reporting again from Kiev. And our correspondent Nick Connolly has arrived in the eastern town of Zaknovshina, near Ukraine's second biggest city, Kharkiv. Nick, what's happening where you are? We've got Nick on the line. Well, this is a region that is very close to Donbass, about 150 kilometers from uh, the administrative capital of Ukraine, in held on the site of lots of uh, explosions today, and also about 100 kilometers away from Kharkiv, Ukraine's second biggest city that is very close to that Russian border. Um, I got off the train, we kind of the dawn was breaking, and we saw people just looking day in and days and kind of confusing their phones, not quite believing that this was finally happening after weeks and months of headlines, that it all seemed a bit unreal. And then within a few hours, you saw people kind of getting their heads around the news and trying to react. People were standing in line outside the banks trying to get cash out. Um, I think the, the supply of cash ran out pretty soon. Same goes for a petrol station, fuel for cars is a big issue. Um, we've seen some Ukrainian military uh, tech hardware out on the streets and uh, anti aircraft, what seem to be anti aircraft uh, missile systems and stations basically in the countryside outside big cities. Um, we've also, I also spoke to some people from the emergency services from the fire brigade who were being called up to head to Donbass, saw them stocking up on food and petrol and uh, basically preparing themselves for, I guess, uh, uh, some uh, engagements that they'd never really uh, thought that as you know, fire brigade uh, servicemen and women or most of them have to have ever have to really confront. It, it sounds like a, a similar reaction to what Funny was just reporting from the capital, but of course you're so much close to uh, where a great deal of the action is, uh, Nick. I, I guess the mood there is, is uh, one of much more urgency. On the other hand, you have to remember that you know, in small towns, people often don't have the resources, just, you know, financial resources, to go anyway. You know, the middle class in the Kiev are more likely to have dollars and euros and uh, connections abroad and some kind of option to leave the country. Here, lots of people told me that they were just going to try their best to stitch it out. Although, you know, people in small villages and towns don't have any particular bomb shelters to go to, they maybe have a cellar, but that's not really very deep and runs the risk of having their own house fall on top of them. Um, so there was a kind of stoic acceptance of the situation. People, uh, some people were telling me that they were annoyed with themselves that they hadn't stocked up on food or cash, um, as had been recommended in previous weeks. But no panic, as, as you heard say, people, yes, trying to queue, trying to get stuff, but not losing their nerve, not shouting each other, keeping their calm. And I think that is just down to the fact that this country has been through more than four or eight years especially here in this part of the country that is close to that Donbass region, has seen military casualties on a regular basis. This is not something people are seeing for the first time. Yes, it's on a far bigger scale. It's coming from all different directions, and that's going to be the biggest problem for Ukraine's forces to deal with those attacks coming from Belarus, coming from Russia, north of Kiev, and from the east, and from Annex Crimea. Although, as we also heard, questions about the reports coming in, how much of that is actually Russian information warfare, an attempt to intimidate Ukraine with fakes, it's obviously very difficult to try and verify the video we're seeing online of various attacks to actually be sure that the locations are those that are being given. Um, but certainly hours of extraordinary stress here in Ukraine, but no sign that you know, average Ukrainians are really losing their heads and panicking for now. Nick, um, we've been reporting on the build-up of troops along the borders over the past days and weeks, and now we're hearing reports this morning of these explosions and incursions in various spots in the south, uh, in the east, where you are, also in central parts of the country and in the capital. Um, can you give us more of an idea of exactly what's going on? Well, and based on information that is available to me online, and as I said, it's very difficult to verify, it does seem like there's a big offensive going on in Donbass, particularly in the Luhansk region. Um, Ukrainian sources saying that the Ukrainian military was actually able to uh, rebuff some of those attacks and regain territory being temporarily lost. That's not verified. 
There are also some reports of uh, Russian pressure coming near Kharkiv, the second biggest city, 50 kilometers from the border. Um, some reports, even of some Russian reports in Kharkiv, although that um, remains to be seen if that's actually um, accurate. Then uh, reports coming from Crimea, annex Crimea in the south. There are even reports of Russian uh, military activity coming from the Black Sea in Odessa, another major city on the Black Sea coast, Ukraine's main port. Um, it's all very difficult to verify uh, right now, but it does seem like the jumping bit is very, very wide. But just to give you a sense of quite how difficult this is going to be, Ukraine has a 2,000 kilometer long border with Russia, and with Belarus, it has a further 1,000 kilometer border. Now that we heard from NATO and the satellite images of Russian troops in Belarus on so called exercises in recent weeks, and they've been saying they're about 20,000 Russian troops in Belarus. The Belarusian border is very, very close to Kiev. This is a very, um, basically, this is Kiev's back, back, backyard, and that's not what it's been marked to particularly defend it. So that is going to be an incredible source of vulnerability for Ukrainian leadership trying to keep operating in Kiev. Um, I think this is, this is kind of a, a campaign that no one really wanted to see coming. Everyone was expecting at worst an intensification of fire in Donbass, in the regions that have already been living in war, war for the past eight years. But to see Ukraine you know, on the entirety of its borders under attack, that was something that no one really wanted to. Okay, Nick Connolly, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, the line's starting to get a little fuzzy. Thank you very much for your reporting uh, from the east of the country there on the ground. We're now joined by Artis Fabrix. He is the Defence Minister of Latvia. Welcome. Share some of your thoughts with us. What's going through your head when you see what's happening in Ukraine this morning? Well, in Latvia, in Hansestadt, Riga, in Baltic countries, of course, all our hearts and minds are with uh, Ukrainians because we understand very much what they are enduring now. Because what we know is that Russians are attacking Ukraine from three sides, which means from the land side of Russian-Ukrainian border, from the sea side uh, of the Black Sea, as well as there are intercourses from the Belarusian side, since Belarus is a part of already a Russian uh, operative area. Additionally, we know that there are also diversion groups sent into the Ukraine. And of course, we all know that uh, Russians are bombing cities and bombing other places with different type of uh, missile systems. So this is what we know. Uh, we also uh, are looking forward very much mm, uh, to the discussions in NATO and European Union about the next steps which should be taken, because unfortunately our analysis in the Baltic countries, in Poland and Sweden and also in Washington, appear to be very correct. And at this moment we have only one chance. First, we must uh, start immediate and massive sanctions against aggressor state of Russia. Secondly, we must provide Ukrainian army and Ukrainian population with massive aid so they can prevail. This is the only way uh, where we can still say that, uh, you know, uh, that blood of Ukrainians will not be also on our hands because our duty, our moral duty is to assist with humanitarian aid, with lethal aid, and I hope that finally also those people which we call Russland Fester or appeasers will finally understand how wrong they have been in their assessments about Kremlin's intentions. Minister, you say Ukraine is being attacked from three sides, which underscores the reports we're coming, uh, that are coming into us and from our correspondents and people on the ground. Uh, how would you then describe uh, this invasion by Russia? I is it an attack on the east or is it an attack on Ukraine as a whole? It's an attack on Ukraine as a whole. It's very obvious. There is a, um, full information available because bombings are going also as far as the very western border of Ukraine. So simply Putin's regime and Russia is trying to put Ukrainians on knees. And of course, this is also a very, very important lesson for all of us uh, which are observing now this uh, mad war waged by Kremlin. And you say that full sanctions are needed. Are we going to get those full sanctions from the EU as well as its partners? Well, as far as it depends on our government and our position, we are ready to do anything to stop this aggressor. And I hope that governments in Berlin and Paris and London will just do the same. 
because if you don't do this, if they don't do this, then the price in future will rise with every hour and every day. Are you ready to pay that? I know I, I wouldn't be, that's for sure. Minister, you also said the second thing that's important is providing aid to Ukraine. Is Ukraine getting enough support from, for example, Germany? Um, I don't think there can be too much support to Ukraine, just like there can't be too much of sanctions. And uh, I would once more use this chance of uh, Deutsche Welle to appeal to German society. Please open your eyes. Please also allow Ukrainians to receive a little aid because the situation is totally different than it was before. And Germany is the largest European country. It's time to act for you now because from you depends a lot. What's your message to the Ukrainian people? We've heard from the president saying to not panic uh, and from our correspondent in Kiev who was saying uh, it's best to stay put right now and not uh, mobilise, not be uh, on the streets. What's your message to the people there? Well, it's very difficult to give an advice when you are not a Ukrainian yourself at this moment. But, uh, of course, um, we see that Ukrainians trust uh, their country and they are brave people. And we keep fingers crossed that you will prevail, you will endure, and you will be capable to defend your freedoms. And as much as it depends uh, from such countries as mine and probably many others, we will do as much as possible to help you. At the end, the right thing always wins, and the right side is on your side. But actually, I have not only a message to Ukrainians, I would write, really would like to appeal also to Russians, because they are misled by their leadership. And do you really, as the Russian soldiers, are ready to kill your Sl Slavonic brothers, your Ukrainians, just because somebody is sending you uh, to this country? It's a very wrong thing. You are not defending Russia, you are simply defending an aggressor. There are so many people on both sides of the border with family and friends in Ukraine, in Russia. Uh, a very pertinent message there from Latvia's Defence Minister, Artis Fapriks. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. And I'm here with DW's Chief International Editor, Richard Walker. Richard, uh, a lot happening as we've been reporting. Uh, talk us through what we know at this moment. Well, as we've been hearing from our reporters on the ground, I mean, what we are witnessing is pretty much the worst case scenario, which uh, the Americans in particular have been warning of uh, with greater and greater urgency in recent weeks. Um, that Vladimir Putin, with this recognition of these um, uh, separatist regions in eastern Ukraine earlier this week, that uh, he wasn't going to stop there, that that was actually the prelude to, to something much, much larger. Um, and it does seem to be all-out total invasion of Ukraine, um, with the goal, as Putin said himself in his, um, in his address overnight, um, the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine and press for bringing to justice those who have committed numerous bloody crimes. Um, that is a signal that, I mean, his goal is to remove the government, uh, to install presumably a government that, um, that he favours. He said that it is not his goal, it's not his objective to... Um, remain in Ukraine um, to, uh, in the long term. But he also has said in the past, in recent weeks, that his goal is not to uh, invade Ukraine. So it's not at all clear whether we can take that at face value. And this notion of demilitarization and denazification uh, of Ukraine, um, it, it frames Ukraine as a threat to Russia, uh, which um, is a pretty hard case to make if you look at the objective facts. Yeah and denazification of Ukraine. Also, it, it, this is, Putin's position has essentially been that Ukraine has been taken over by illegitimate nationalists and Nazis. If you look at Vladimir Zelensky, he's a democratically elected leader who happens also to be Jewish, uh, who lost ancestors in the Holocaust. So there is an offensive element to what uh, he said there. But if we take that as what Putin is now saying to his people on this day, that's what we're looking at. This is total war aimed at um, regime change, essentially, toppling the government. That said, what do you see happening in the coming hours? Do you expect 
Ukraine to launch a counteroffensive? <clears throat> well, Ukraine is already saying that it's fighting back, but but it is, um, and of course, it will be able to inflict uh, some uh, casualties, and it is claiming already to have shot down a, a number of um, of Russian planes, um, but. The Ukrainian army simply and the Ukrainian military is not a match for the force that we've seen assembled here by Vladimir Putin. This is what lay behind the warnings that we've seen in recent weeks, is the scale of this force, the number of battalions that, that Vladimir Putin has moved to the north, to the east, to the south, completely surrounding Ukraine on three sides. Um, so it is doubtful that the Ukrainians will be able to stand up to this onslaught for very long. So then it becomes a question, uh, essentially, of what happens next. Um, looking at this from the outside world, the Western world has, also, uh, has obviously done as much as it felt it could do to deter this from taking place with threatening sanctions um, and already imposing some sanctions after the recognition of, of these regions early in the week. But also by bringing in troops themselves to neighbouring countries. That's true. So, but of course, that's another level. That's not going to protect Ukraine. That's about protecting countries like Latvia. And it was very interesting, of course, and compelling to hear La uh, the defense minister of Latvia just now speaking to us. Um, those countries um, are the front line of NATO defenses. Ukraine um, is not going to receive any Western troops uh, to defend it. So it's, in, in military terms, it's standing alone. It has received um, a certain amount of weapons in recent weeks um, from uh, Western countries, not including Germany, and that's caused a lot of discussion about, about Germany's responsibilities. Um, but in terms of actual troops on the ground, that's not going to happen. Joe Biden's been very clear about that, and of course that would present the risk uh, of a confrontation directly between uh, the two superpowers, the US and Russia, and that could lead to... Um, yeah, a, a very even more serious war. Obviously. On the topic of Germany, uh, we saw Germany come to the table as far as sanctions go and really pull out that big card uh, with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, putting that on hold, that project, um, which will hurt both sides, uh, but really hurt Russia uh, financially. But as far as helping out on the uh, weapons front, uh, do you expect that something uh, that topic to be uh, raised here in Germany today? Well, certainly that that debate is not going away. I mean, Olaf Scholz, the German uh, Chancellor, has been uh, doing the rounds of television interviews this week, explaining the move since the uh, recognition of those regions. We're also expecting to hear from him in about an hour, I think. So it'll be interesting to see what he says then. Uh, so far, he's very much stuck to his line that providing weapons is not what uh, Germany wants to do. Um, and there are various arguments that he uses to back that up. Um, but just this morning, a very senior member of the Green Party was calling for uh, Germany to go further. Uh, the Green Party has generally been more hawkish in the course of this um, crisis so far. Uh, it has had a long-standing, very critical view of Russia, the, the direction that Russia has been going in. Um, and there are various voices around other political parties also calling for for um, weapons to be supplied. Um, I would assume that um, the government is going to stay with this line. The reality is that supplying weapons to, the, to Ukraine at this point is unlikely to change uh, the situation on the ground. In effect, weapon supplies, the, 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 if weapon supplies were going to achieve anything, it would have been more as a deterrent effect to try to um, make it clear to Vladimir Putin uh, that he couldn't just walk in and take Ukraine easily. Um, and it's obviously too late, too late for that now. Um, but there is a really intense debate beginning in Germany really since the beginning of this week when Vladimir Putin announced his recognition of these leaders about whether Germany's whole attitude to Russia in the last, in recent decades, and especially since um, uh, the annexation of Crimea in 2014, has simply been completely wrong-headed, uh, based on wishful thinking that uh, Russia was a country that could be engaged with, that Russia was a country that could be kind of coaxed into a, into a more a democratic and, and liberal and peaceful attitude to the world. Um, and I'd like to draw attention to one really extraordinary intervention by the chief of the German army writing on his LinkedIn page just a couple of hours ago, um, absolutely condemning um, what he sees as a, as a lack of investment in the military, um, saying that he's fed up, that the army has uh, is 
uh, has, is essentially standing empty-handed when looking at the options that it could provide uh, to, um, to supporting uh, uh, other members of the NATO alliance, for instance, supporting uh, Latvia and other countries that are now feeling a greater threat. Um, so a really extraordinary outburst there by, um, by the head of the German army, indicating that he views that Germany and German politics have simply underestimated the threat from Russia for many years now. DW's chief international editor, Richard Borker, thank you very much for the analysis.